All right, welcome to the screencast for Aeneid lines one, book one, lines 157 through 869. Um, so in this scene, the Trojans who have just gone through the big storm and have, you know, they're worn out, they're going to make landfall, um, find a safe harbor. And so this scene basically describes them getting there and what they see. And this right here is a little woodcut that um, actually shows kind of the, the scene of the Trojans landing. All right, so it starts out with death, fessi nei di, quae proxima litori cursu, contendent petere et libiae were tunter ad oras. All right, so here we have um, defesi aeneadi. This basically, this aeneadi here is referring to the people in Aeneas's band. So you could say like Aeneas's men or the Aeneans. So uh, the wary Aeneans strive to seek shores, litera, which are um, proxima, quae proxima cursu, like which are nearest to their course. And um, they turn to Libyan coasts or Libyan shores. Now this est here introduces what really what the rest of this passage is going to be, which is a kind of a light ekphrasis. Um, basically what that means is that it's, it's just a description of a thing or place, but it, it goes beyond the scope of what it really needs to be. And it starts getting into the realm of maybe things that aren't really true or things that definitely the Aeneans don't know in the time but it basically just goes it's very elaborate and it goes beyond what is necessary to describe the place this is not a very grand one there's some much grander ones that dr jones has told us about in class but this is kind of a light example of it all right so um est in secesu longo locus insula portum efficit objectu laterum Quibus omnis ab alto fraginter inque sinus scindit sese unda reductus. So um, we have in a long inlet, there is a place and where or like where an island forms a port and um, forms a port by overhanging sides. So where an island forms a port by overhanging sides, which, so then this omnis, we have to find what this, um, what this modifies and it's this unda. So we jump all the way down to this unda. So which omnis unda, like all waves are in this case, you could say like every wave ab alto from the deep. That's a little bit of metonymy right there. We see that one a lot, but still a nice example of it. Um, so which every wave from the deep breaks and every wave breaks itself into the reductus, so into the receding, into the receding bay. And so basically, I've got a little, a little picture here, but what they're describing is there's kind of this bay back here, this nice island here. So as the waves crash in from the coastline, they're breaking on this island and then kind of coming into this bay calmly. And so there's a nice sheltered area for the Indians in here. Now we have hink atque hink wasta rupes gemenique minanter in caelum scopuli quorum subvertice late i cora tuta silent tum si silvis skyna coruscus de super horenti quatrum nemus imminent umbra. All right, so this hink atque hink, um, this basically means this side and that. So like on this side and on that side. Um, so huge cliffs and the twin rocks, Minanter and Kylum. So they tower in the sky or they threaten into the sky. So um, this is an interesting kind of kind of interesting phrasing by Virgil here. So he's just described this bay as kind of like this peaceful place of refuge, but now he's using Minanter, like threaten and tower, which are kind of intimidating words. So. Maybe it's a little foreshadowing. Maybe things aren't going to go so well in this bay. We'll see. All right. And then, so under the summits of which the, um, the safe sea is silent, um, latte, so far and wide. And again, that kind of 
juxtaposed with that Minantar, kind of we've got some threatening words here, but also Virgil's describing this as a really safe place. So then we have Tum Siwasu. Um, then there is a background from above with bristling forests and a black grove, this Atrum Namus, like a black grove threatens um, back to the, um, the imminent here, threatens with a, a trembling shadow. So again, that kind of presents a little bit more of a dark picture of this place in contrast to some of the nicer things Virgil said. Fronte sub adversa scopulis pendentibus antrum, intus aequo, aquae dulces vivoque sedila saxo, nympharam domus. Hic fessas non vincula naves, ulla tenent, unco non aligat ancora morsu. All right, so we've got this fronte sub adversa, so um, under adversa, like opposing or opposite, under the opposing or opposite face, um, there's a cave with hanging rocks. So if you've ever been to Luray Caverns or something, you've seen the stalactites hanging down from the top, that's what Virgil's talking about here. And then you've got this Intus aequae dulces vivoque sedila saxo. So um, within there is fresh water and seats in the vivoque saxo, in the living rock. Um, that that dulces is literally, literally like sweet water, but in this case you can kind of infer that that's meaning fresh water because after a long time at sea, that's what the Indians are going to want. And that those seats of living rock basically is like implying that this is these are natural natural formations, not man-made. And then Nymphorum Domus, so the home of nymphs. All right, so we've got hic fessas, um, so non vincula naves la tenant. So here, um, no chains hold any um, fessas naves, any tired ships. And this is a little bit of personification right here. Obviously it's the Trojans who are tired, not the ships. And we've got unco non aligat ancora morsu. So no anchor holds them with its curved bite. Um, so basically what Virgil's doing here is he's just telling you how kind of wild this place is, how it's untouched by man. There's no no docks to dock their ships, there's no anchors, there's no ships already here docked, so he's just kind of painting a picture of how, how remote this is. Um, Alright, so that is the lines. Thank you for listening.